Good morning. This is June 2nd, uh, morning worship. And as we enter into this uh, period of communion, I would like to ask you to uh, get control of your mind and put all your burdens at the door. We need, as we come into worship each morning, we need to leave all of the negativism, all of our burdens and uh, problems at the door and come in uh, to rest a while, to get spiritual rest and peace of mind. So as we have been discussing the deeper significance of the Lord's Supper, uh, I'd like to have you continue in your thought control to concentrate on the subject so that we can get the knowledge of what it means to us. I'd like to take you, Michelle, I'm reading from page uh, 1140 in 7A Bible Commentary. Now these are, are the uh, real things that we're thinking about this morning so that we can become the real people that God designs we should be. Volume 5. We're talking about uh, in this, uh, on this page the new covenant of Jesus' blood. And so uh, we're, t we're thinking about the old covenant of blood and the new covenant of blood. They're both the, uh, blood covenants, aren't they? What's it say? It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin, right? So in the Old Testament, children, it was the blood of animals that were slain and uh, the blood ministered in the sanctuary, right? In the New Testament, whose blood was it? Whose blood are we talking about in the New Testament? The sacrifice uh, for us. And mediated. So now, uh, Sister White says that to continue the old typical sacrifices would have been uh, of no use. It says, eating of the body and drinking of the blood of Christ, not merely at the sacramental service, but daily partaking of the bread of life to satisfy the soul's hunger, would be in receiving his word and doing his will. Uh, Sister White likens in the Acts of the Apostles also the study of the Word of God as eating the bread and drinking the blood of the Son of God. That is, we're learning about it, right? We're learning about it, and in that way, we are not only to observe the sacramental service at the appointed times, but we are to study and also eat the bread, eat the words of the scriptures and digest them and let it become a part of us. So uh, she's speaking about this in Review and Herald, and uh, she says on John 3, 16, 18, she says, a new conception of love, and that's what we need today, a new concept. And what is love? says, why was this called a new commandment? says, the disciples had not loved one another as Christ had loved them. Let's think about that a little bit. That's why a new covenant had to be introduced, because the disciples had not loved one another like Christ loved them. They had not seen the fullness of the love that he was to reveal in man's behalf. They were yet to see him dying on the cross for their sins. Through his life and death, they were to receive a new conception of love. And that's what it is to mean to us that we're to get a new vision. 
says the command to love one another was to gain a new meaning in the light of his self-sacrifice. Well, does that give us the key that we might have to be self-sacrificing too? It was a new revelation of love in the sacrifice of Christ for us who were his enemies. We're God's enemies, aren't we? We don't mean to be, but we are because we are so unenlightened and so unlovely that a new vision has to be given to us. In the light shining from the cross of Calvary, they were to read the meaning of the words, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. We know in our hearts that we're remiss on this point. Don't we? Don't we know that in our hearts we have not measured up to this new commandment? I haven't, but I want to. It says, why should this commandment be new to the disciples? The words, as I have loved you, were yet to be fulfilled by the offering. He was about to make for the sins of the world. So as Christ had loved them, the disciples were to love one another. Well, I'm hoping that somehow we may come to that place. It's going to be the great miracle that happens to the branch, isn't it? It's going to be a great miracle. It says they were to show forth the love abiding in their hearts for men, women, and children by doing all in their power for their salvation. Are we doing all we can this morning to save the branches here at Mount Carmel? Are we trying to save one another? To encourage and strengthen one another? If we're not doing this, we're failing. It says, but they were to reveal a specially tender love for all of the same faith. Well, when you live close together, and you have to endure the frets of the day, it's not easy to manifest true love for one another, is it? Because rough edges are abrasive, aren't they? And it causes friction. But this is the design of the new covenant to bring forth a new vision in our hearts of the love of God manifested toward the brethren. It says love is a permanent power. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Well, he loved us enough to die for us, right? Well, these are just words to us if we don't get them in our mind and get control of our mind so that we might really eat these words Eat the body and the blood of the Son of God. Understand the words that are written. Love is not simply an impulse, a transitory emotion. It's not just a fleeting thing dependent upon circumstances. That is, if everything's going smooth, we love one another, right? But it's in the, the rough billows that we are tested, isn't it? As to what is really in our hearts if we love one another. It says the soul is fed by the streams of pure love that flow from the heart of Christ as a wellspring that never fails. It's constant, in other words. So as we, as we take daily from the words of scripture about God, then this stream continually flows into our hearts so it can flow out to others' hearts. And it will not be manifested in unlovely ways as in the past. It says, oh, how is the heart quickened? How are the motives ennobled? Its affections deepened by this communion under the education and discipline of the Holy Spirit, the children of God love one another truly. 
sincerely, unaffectedly, and without partiality. The lovely people are easy to love, aren't they? But it's the unlovely that are difficult to love. And if someone is unlovely to us, the test of our Christianity is whether we can look over that and love them in spite of those ugly things. That's what Christ did. That was his example. He loved us in all of our disobedience and ugliness and lostness, hopelessly lost without a vision of what has been done for us. I think that we may have lost the appreciation. And also without hypocrisy, without just pretense. It says, and this because the heart is in love with Jesus. We have to really fall in love with the one who made everything possible. And if we're not in love, we can't show love, can we? It says our affection for one another. Now let's think about this. Our affection for one another springs for, from our common relationship to God. So if our personal relationship with God is in order, it's going to automatically bring forth love in our hearts for one another, isn't it? So if we're not loving one another, if we're not bearing with one another's infirmities, then it's because of the absence of the love of God in our hearts. We are one family. We love one another as he loved us. When compared with the true, sanctified, disciplined affection, the shallow courtesy of the world, the meaningless expressions of effusive friendship are as chaff to the wheat. So all of the sentimental uh, demonstrations that is so evident in the world is only a, a, just a surface thing. It's not a deep emotional experience, is it? And as I say, and the Bible says, Jesus says it's easy to love those who love us. But where the test comes is to love those who do not love us or whom we do not love. That's a test of our Christianity, the test of our righteousness. Is that right, Tilly? What do you think? Why do we think about these things? So if you don't have the love in your heart for your brother, you're a murderer. That's what Jesus says. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Oh, strong words, isn't it? I hope I don't hate anybody. Well, we need to pray that we won't hate anybody because it's in our hearts. It's there. To love as Christ loved means to manifest unselfishness at all times and in all places by kind words and pleasant looks. Are we doing this? Tell me. I haven't been doing it like I should. And you need to ask yourself if you're doing it as you should. Says the, <clears throat> these kind words and pleasant looks, says these cost those who give them nothing. Not really, it's not expensive, is it? But they leave behind a fragrance that surrounds the soul. Beautiful, pleasant words water the souls of others, right? says their effect can never be estimated. The worth of kind looks, kind words, and kind acts can never be estimated. You can't count the worth of them because it's so great. says not only are they a blessing to the receiver, Look what this says. It says, not only the one who gives the kind words, the kind acts, is blessed, 
but to the giver of these words a blessing comes. And that's why it's so important to us to realize that it's our words that give the sting of death or a savor of life to others. We're going to be responsible for each other, for each other's souls here this morning. We're responsible to God for other people's souls. And it costs us very little except self-crucifixion to give a person a kind word or a kind thought or get, lift their burden. says it blesses the giver because these words react upon the one who gives them. So we're saving ourselves when we give kind words to others, aren't we? We're making ourselves more righteous. We're, we become the image of the words we speak. The Bible says, Jesus says, uh, that we will be held accountable for every word we speak. And those are the things in the judgment that is going to judge us. So, bridle the tongue. Pray and agonize to get the victory over the member of uh, your body that is killing you. Genuine love is a precious attribute of heavenly origin. It's not earthly. It's a gift from heaven which increases in fragrance in proportion as it is dispensed to others. As the stream gives, as it goes along, it gets, doesn't it? But if it gets dammed up, it stagnates and loses its usefulness. So we're talking about the mighty river of Ezekiel that becomes a living stream that brings healing to all of those who are diseased, spiritually and physically. So let us become streams of living water. Let's determine this morning. Let's pray and agonize before the Lord that we might be a living stream. How many would like to be a living stream? Live yourself and bring life to others. I know it's in the heart of everyone to do that, really. But as we make our commitment before the Lord in these meetings at the worship hour, then power will be given to us to be that, to be what we should be. This is where we get the power to do it or the determination or the desire. Christ's love in deep and earnest flowing like an irrepressible stream to all who will accept it. There is no selfishness in his love. If this heaven-born love is an abiding principle in the heart, it will make itself known. It cannot be concealed, can it? Not only to those we hold most dear in sacred relationship, but to all with whom we come in contact, both in the family and outside the family. There will be no exclusiveness, no partiality, because it's one spirit, isn't it? God is, God's love is one spirit of love that cannot be diluted and separated to benefit just certain ones. That is not God's love. It will lead us to bestow little acts of attention to make concessions, to perform deeds of kindness, to speak tender, true, encouraging words. Are we hearing this? What does it mean to us this morning? It says, the love of God will lead us to bestow little acts of attention upon somebody and to make concessions. 
give in in certain things where you can, or to perform deeds of kindness, to speak tender, true, encouraging words. Sister White says, do not speak doubt because you drown in it. It's a pit that you fall in yourself. <clears throat> it will lead us to sympathize with those whose hearts hunger for sympathy. There's not a soul in here this morning that doesn't appreciate sympathy. Is there, Sister Doyle? D don't we blossom under a, an expression of sympathy for others? For our situation that we're in, or our problem, we need to uphold one another and need to relieve each other's burdens here at Mount Carmel so that in seeking to save others, we be lost ourselves. Selfishness and pride hinder the pure love that unites us in the spirit of Jesus Christ. If this love is truly cultivated, Finite will blend with finite and all will center in the infinite. Infinite. What is that saying to us? Humanity, which is finite, will blend together and they, when they're blended together, will be united with the infinite, with God. That's the pattern. Because Jesus says you love one another so that you can benefit from the love of God. If we do not find some way that we can love one another, be kind and tender-hearted toward one another, we cannot enjoy the love of God. We cannot have it. We cannot benefit from this uh, tremendous gift that has been made for us individually. It's in the sharing of God's gifts that we obtain them. You believe that, Brother Friesen? As we share the good gifts that we receive from God is the way that we keep them so we don't lose them. Humanity will unite with humanity and all will be bound up with a heart of infinite love. Sanctified love for one another is sacred. Now there's different definitions of love, different types of love, isn't there? There's a love for the child for the mother and the mother for the child and to the father. And then there's the love between the father and the mother. And there's love for those outside the family. And it's all a manifestation of the love of the family of God in our lives says, in this great work, Christian love for one another, far higher, more constant, more courteous, more unselfish than has been seen, than we have understood before, preserves Christian tenderness, Christian benevolence, and politeness and enfolds the human brotherhood in the embrace of God. Acknowledging the dignity with which God has invested the rights of man. I think that's a beautiful thought. Do you understand it? You understand the, the point of this? It says the love, the Christian love for one another is a very high and exalted concept. It's not as we uh, carnally understand it. It's a far higher, more constant, more courteous, more unselfish than we have ever seen. And that's what God is trying to do for us this morning. And in the revelation uh, through the Holy Spirit, is to bring us to that position of a higher love, a higher consideration for one another than we've ever seen before. And you know what? It's a devil's intended purpose to defeat that plan, isn't it? Just as it was in the beginning. 
And that's the warfare that we're having. It's not from the outside. It's the warfare that Satan is waging for the souls of the branches here at Mount Carmel, for the souls of the branches out in the fields. This organizing, this uniting, causing branches to hate one another for whatever reason. We don't have any reason to hate one another. No reason that God gives. Because those who hated God received the unboundless love the manifested in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that we might have that experience in our hearts. Finally, understand it. We haven't understood it, have we? Have we? This dignity... Christians must ever cultivate for the honor and glory of God. This is the way we glorify God, to show the world that we love one another. It hasn't been done, has it? As it has to be done. The only begotten Son of God recognized the nobility of humanity, not just a few, but the holistic picture of humanity. By taking humanity upon himself and dying in behalf of humanity, testifying throughout all the ages that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've heard this so much. We have lost the meaning of this verse, John 3:16. says, true sanctification unites believers to Christ and to one another in the bonds of tender sympathy. Have we been uniting with Christ and with one another in this bond of sympathy, of tender love for one another? Have we? We need to ask ourselves these things every day, every moment that we're in contact with one another. I see that we're miserably failing. I've failed. you failed. But it need not continue. And it all comes back to forsaking our idols, the words that we speak and the thoughts that we think. And unless we come to the place where we can put these idols away, we will not prepare for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And my message to all the branches everywhere is to take to heart these words so that we may overcome. We may be instrumentalities to save others. This union causes to flow constantly into the heart rich currents of Christ-like love which flows forth again in love for one another. Do we have the love of God in our hearts? Is it flowing out to one another? Is it? We need to ask ourselves these things. Otherwise, we're just tinkling symbols. The qualities which it is essential for all to possess are those which mark the completeness of Christ's character and his goodness. These attributes are gained by doing kindly actions with a kindly heart. Just don't do something for someone and hate it all the while, you know? But doing, do it from the kindness and goodness of your heart. Take care of things at Mount Carmel because you see the need and you don't have to be told of the need, but because it's in your heart to have respect for God's property and for God's people. Build up, help one another, be kind to one another, and do not fall in the trap of Satan that is to take us out of his work. It is the greatest and most fatal deception to suppose that a man can have faith unto life eternal without possessing Christ-like love for his brethren. 
So we're hopelessly lost if we do not manifest love for the brethren. Amen? How many can say amen to that? Well, we need to realize this more now than ever before. He who loves God and his neighbor is filled with light and love. Light and love go together because they're from God. They're not from Satan. God is in him and all around him, this person that has the light and love of God. And nothing shall offend them. Right? Those that love God, nothing shall offend them. Christian love, Christian love, Christians love those around them as precious souls for whom Christ has died. We see, we should see in every person a soul for whom Christ died, precious in his sight. There is no such thing as a loveless Christian. You understand that? Without love, you can't be Christ-like. For God is love, and hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And what did Christ say was the sign that we love God? If we love the brethren, says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. This is the fruit that is to be given back to God. The fruit of our love for the brethren is what we offer back to God in return for the gift that was made available to us. The powers of darkness stand a poor chance against believers who love one another as Christ loved them, who refuse to create alienation and strife, who stand together, who are kind, courteous, and tender-hearted, cherishing the faith that, faith that works by love and purifies the soul. We're talking about purification of the church. This is what it takes. Otherwise, the church will never be pure. We must have the Spirit of Christ or we are none of His. The love of Christ is a golden chain that binds a finite human being who, who believe in Jesus Christ to the infinite God. The love that the Lord has for his children passeth knowledge. We can't comprehend it, can we? Because we wouldn't go out and die for someone that hates us, would we? We're not like God, are we? It says no science can define or explain this. This can't be explained by the finite mind. The more we feel the influence of this love, the more meek and humble shall we be. So if we manifest any other spirit, it's not of Christ, is it? Of tender, compassionate love toward one another. The disciples' credentials here, she says, how broad, how full is this love. The new part of the commandment the disciples did not understand we do not understand it yet, but if we open our hearts and minds, we will understand it. They were to love one another as Christ loved them. They were their credentials. 